In this episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast, we sit down and talk with Facilios Korakakis, who has his PhD and is a physical therapist and expert in musculoskeletal rehabilitation and blood flow restriction. We discuss his research on BFR and pain relief and how we can apply his research findings into practice. We also discuss device selection and in particular, our shared interest on the potential impact of autoregulation as well as BFR safety screening. I hope you enjoy the episode. What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast with me, the human performance mechanic, or my God-given name, Nicholas Rolnick. I'm here today with Vasilios Korakakis. I got it. Um, and I'm very excited to have this conversation. Um, he is uh, an expert worldwide in rehabilitation, teaches courses all over the place, but also has his hand and maybe feet, I don't know, in uh, blood flow restriction. So I'm very excited to have him on and talk about the different ways in which BFR may or may not be better for results, as well as hitting on some of his other relevant research and how we can apply that into our practice. So welcome to the podcast. If you just want to spend a couple minutes just giving the viewers, listeners your background, that would be very much appreciated. And then we'll dive right in. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, Nicholas, and uh, for the introduction. Uh, I'm actually um, being a clinician, and I've always kept a clinical footprint in my career. I used to work as a clinical physiotherapist in Aspetar in Doha for about eight years, eight and something years. And then I quitted my job and moved to London uh, as a teaching fellow at uh, King's College London. Uh, this summer, I decided to quit again for the second time within a couple of years. And now I have an affiliation with the University of Nicosia in Cyprus, and I'm just a visiting uh, teaching fellow in a couple of universities around Europe. I don't do any clinical stuff for the moment. I'm interested in research, and I'm just teaching courses, um, as you said. I've got a PhD in hardcore biomechanics, spinal biomechanics, and a couple of masters in exercise and health in general. That's all from my side. Sounds like a lot from your side. Um, how, I guess, um, did you get into wanting to do research? And more specifically, um, how did blood flow restriction get on your radar? Uh, yes, uh, research was something that I was interested in, but never actually started doing anything uh, real and decent up to the time that I moved to Doha. Uh, there I had a great time and a great opportunity to work along with um, some big names of physiotherapy like Karim Khan, Rod Whiteley, um, Eric Wittfrau, Roald Barr, and other names, as you know. So they push you through this uh, process and uh, it's always better for you. Uh, so my research career started there back in the day in 2014-15. And actually, with regard to your second question, how I was uh, involved in BFR research, I've got to observe physios working in Aspetar because we have an open plan space working over there. And you get the sense that when you didn't have a patient to just observe anyone you like in an environment with 60 plus physios from 40 something nationalities. So imagine that's why after 10 years speaking in English, I still have a strong Greek accent. So I figured out there that uh, people that were just using these surgery tourniquets, it was not BFR, it was something different, something that I used to see in the, in the operating room, and I've got, um, I've got involved in the process. So this intrigued my interest in blood flow restriction training, plus uh, the testimonials of patients after the application of this intervention. Yeah, so what were what were the patients saying about BFR and how and how or what it did for their rehabilitation? Yeah, first of all, I have to just to draw you the scenery back in the day because we were a bit lost as everybody else. So how much of a pressure, let's say 120 millimeters of mercury to everybody 
uh, no calculations, no measurements, nothing, just experimentation. But we figure out that um, in a significant percentage of the patients that we use blood flow restriction additive to the external load during issues like intraarticular osteochondral defects and similar stuff like this, we figured out that the pain was significantly less immediately after the application. So this was the first um, thing that dragged me into this rabbit hole. Yeah, and that, I mean, that kind of segues into your publications on, you know, on, on BFR and pain. So kind of take me through, because I think there's, what, two or three projects? There's, I know there's, there. it, it basically built upon itself um, over, yeah. over a period of years. So just take, take us through kind of how the first study was set up, what was the interesting things that you found, and then why you decided to continue to pursue this line of research. Okay, so uh, the clinical observation became anecdotal evidence. We started collecting data, case series that we presented in uh, several conferences like Isokinetic, Sports Medicine Australia, uh, in Copenhagen, the Sports Medicine Congress over there. It's this, oh, I, I guess this is, is this this weekend, the, the conference. The, the, the Copenhagen conference? Yes, the Sports Congress. It's going to be this weekend. So uh, after uh, presenting in conferences and the... Um, and the audience received this presentation quite interestingly with a lot of questions and uh, sharing knowledge and sharing experiences. Uh, we decided to write the first paper that was a case series of 30 individuals with anterior knee pain. And through experimentation, I will say this for a second time, I will reiter reiterate myself in terms of uh, we didn't have the complete knowledge of the application. So we were trying to change stuff. We were trying to standardize the process. And um, against all uh, researcher fr researchers from uh, different areas, we've started calculating the occlusion pressure by using an ultrasound, a Doppler ultrasound, not as usually be done down to the ankle, but uh, at the popliteal artery. Mm -hmm. It was quite technical at the moment, but um, we got some very good results in terms of standardization after a few weeks of practicing. So the first study goes like this. Anterior knee, uh, anterior knee pain patients, uh, post-ACL reconstruction, patellar tendinopathy, osteochondral defects, meniscal repairs, meniscal removals, some other stuff, um, uh, osteoarthritis. So it's a mixture of 30 individuals. And we decided because we used, uh, in the, the plan was to standardize the process in terms of replication. So we decided to use a maximum of five kilograms by using adjustable ankle weights as an external load. And the question was around the department. I was just walking around and asked the people, what do you feel about using five kilograms to do leg extension? Is this a big load or a low load? And everybody said it's really low load. So we decided to start with that. We applied the pain monitoring approach in terms of how much of a load you can apply to your knee joint without having significant pain that was defined by a pain equal or less to four out of 10. And it was just a question, not going into the, the seeds of pain perception and uh, definition of pain from different uh, aspects, all pain as a construct in general. And then we decided to do one set to maximum repetitions by following the pace of a metronome and uh, dealing with a range of motion from 90 to zero degrees. And uh, this was followed by three sets of 15 repetitions with 30 seconds in between as a rest. So this differentiates our study compared to the rest of the studies that they did the 30 repetitions as a first set. Because through clinical observation, we figure out that probably in terms of pain modulation, it's not the BFR itself, probably is the combination of the blood flow restriction and the exertion of the exercise, no matter the load. So this is the case. We calculated everything. We put these individuals. Uh, we standardized the testing, the outcomes. So by using clinical stuff, not the questionnaires, not something that is not quite relevant. Step down test, shallow and deep single leg squat. How much pain do you have pre, post application? And because we use this as a pain modulation method or a moderator of our treatment, as we use, for example, in other clinical uh, cases and places like acupuncture, I don't use acupuncture, but I'm just saying, or um, 
kinesio tape or whatever you have in mind, Tekar, for example. So we use this application as a pain modulating procedure and then a physical therapy session followed. So we got a measurement pre-application immediately after the intervention and, for, and following a physiotherapy session of 45 minutes. So we got all the individuals, and this is the most important part of the study, and I will uh, come back to that. Uh, through this process, everybody reported pain decreased after the application, and this opened a window of opportunity for us as clinicians to load all these patients by using normal loading in machines or in functional exercises. Speaking and of my more, bias. Yep. <laughs> Active interventions, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. And um, the most important part of the study, because this is how I would like to define it at this, uh, at this point, we got no non-responders. It means if you do this right, the pain is decreased to everybody. And after that, we decided to narrow down the sample into more specific criteria. So we did a control study, a pilot randomized control study, same application, but the control group did only the exercise part with five kilos with adjustable ankle weights and the pain monitoring approach. And we found no significant between group differences. This might be the result of a small sample size. However, we know that exercise can decrease pain by itself without the application of blood flow restriction. And then we decided to do something different because uh, blood flow restriction is um, it's a catchy approach. It's something that uh, attracts the eye. It's something new. It's uh, Instagrammable, as you see. So we decided to use a blood flow restriction cuff uh, as a placebo, as a sham intervention. And uh, we figure out in a small sample size at the pilot randomized control trial, similar effects great decrease immediately after. There was a significant difference between exercise alone and placebo or some blood flow restriction and some blood flow restriction got a percentage of absolute pain reduction difference from just the exercise uh, of the range of 15 to 20%. This is significant as a clinical mm -hmm. observation. And this ends up with the studies with anterior knee pain then we've tried to collect data and replicate this uh, similar uh, intervention by assessing pressure pain thresholds. And we have already collected data for the lower limb and the PhD student of mine is assessing the shoulder in shoulder impeachment rotator cuff conditions. Similarly, we did the same study by applying blood flow restriction in the upper limb and TMSing transcranial magnetic stimulation with two of my master's students at King's College. And these data are probably going to be published in the next couple of months. Uh, plus, we have done a couple of randomized control trials for uh, a lateral elbow tendinopathy by using blood flow restriction. And I have published with, uh, with my colleagues and team, uh, I think five systematic reviews assessing the effects of blood flow restriction. That's um, an overview of my research interest into this intervention. Yeah, I think from what I remember of your second study, when you compared, wasn't there a portion of the low intensity group alone that actually got worse pain report? Um, yeah. Was uh, so so like I I remember there would be no between group differences, yes. but. I did. I I remember reading somewhere that in in one of your papers that the low intensity group alone there was a a sizable portion of people who got worse after just doing low intensity exercise. So yes. that to me was saying, and I and I agree with you that in in pain modulation it's intensity and it's you know and that could be driven by predominantly load in terms of resistance exercise. I don't know why it just gave me a little. I guess it's AI, you know, um, yeah. and uh, that, you know, and so we're also in, we're in final stages of our manuscript. Um, it may be published by the time this comes out um, where we looked at um, pain condition, pain modulation, pain pressure threshold but we compared low intensity BFR to um, moderate intensity exercise. So now we looked at that and we showed that BFR had a superior 
uh, condition pain or pain hypoalgesic response compared to moderate intensity exercise, and both were taken to volitional fatigue. Um, so it's gonna it, there there is something there. I I do strongly agree that for for us as clinicians and anybody watching this, um, I think what would be your recommendation for implementation based on your research, how people can implement this approach in their practices to help produce a analgesic or hypoalgesic uh, response? And what are the different ways in which you can kind of insert BFR to help with that? And what variables could, you know, maybe relevant in that uh, prescription? This is a big question, so it will take a little bit of time to answer every bit of it. I will start from the beginning. Yes, you're correct. The control group, by using only five kilograms of open kinetic chain exercise, got worse. And this is quite significant if you consider that five kilos, it's almost nothing for the lower limb muscles. Um, I've read your research quite interesting. And then as a result of your moderate exercise, I would say that the, the systematic review of Song et al. a couple of years ago, they figure out that there is a linear, linear, I'm sorry, linear relationship between the load, the application of the load and the hypoalgesic effect in healthy individuals, similarly to other systematic reviews. So probably the application of blood flow restriction changes the, the criteria in order to decide how much of a hypoalgesic effect you will have as a result. So my take on by reading all this stuff and mixing my ideas, research and evidence is that we are still a bit confused as clinicians because of the research, not because the research is not well conducted. The research does not tell you this application is for pain reduction or this application is just targeting muscle volume. So the clinician will not take as a take home message that in order to decrease pain, you need, you need high percentage of occlusion. And this is my take on. If you want to decrease pain, you have to go with 70 to 80% of limb occlusion pressure. And as a result of the exercise, if you would ask your patient how much of a, of a difficulty you figure out during this process in a modified ball scale, if they will not say more than seven or eight, probably the analgesic effect is not enough. This is my clinical observation. Uh, I, I, you... By the way, I, I agree. I think that I am in my practice and my bias. Um, if you've kind of seen some of the, the papers that I've put out there, um, I know this is our first conversation that we're having, but I am very much a moderate pressure biased person, except for two situations predominantly. Um, the first one was what you said which is we know that pressure is a variable to increase excel or increase discomfort and accelerate that fatiguing process. And we know that there's some condition pain modulation response where if we induce additional discomfort, that might help with the analgesic response to exercise. So high pressures in that situation. And then high pressures for any sort of ischemic preconditioning, postconditioning, however you want to use it, um, because that is just trying to maximize the hyperemic response um, to to exercise. But I totally am on board with this. And this is exactly, you know, how I, um, my model in my head is, in terms of, of that. So fully, fully agree to that for sure. Things are, are getting a bit different if uh, when it goes to the upper limb, because I guess 80% of the upper limb is not uh, applicable. I, I would say something between 50 and 60% as a high pressure for the upper limb. This is uh, my take on again on this. Uh, high it's very I mean, I mean, I, when I do, when I do, I've tried IPC on my upper limb um, and I've tried high pressures. You get numbness and tingling like much quicker. It's really uncomfortable. It's it, to be honest, even with the standardization of pressure, I don't think that the upper limb can can handle that. Um, and that's probably just due to the proximity of the neurovasculature relative to the leg where it's a little bit more protected um, inside the, the, the thigh. 
Um, I agree. I agree with you. We had uh, during piloting for TMSing students in uh, at King's College, uh, we had a couple of uh, fainting issues by using the upper limb and pressures above 60%. So we decided that the 50 to 60 was uh, more easy to, to take on during the, the, the process. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it's, uh, it's online with, uh, in line with the uh, published literature though. Mm -hmm. So getting back to how would a physical therapist looking to maximize the analgesic response? So you said high pressures, right? And what about repetition scheme? what what about load what are where and and also what about the where in the rehab so in your research you started it out in the beginning but is there a way is there any world that you see bfr being done in the middle or being done at the end if pain relief is your goal um i've tried to keep the um, the pain reduction thing in a separate box than the application of blood flow restriction in terms of strengthening or muscle volume or re um, recruitment or whatever. So my clinical thinking is based on a reasoning that what do you do in your clinical practice? Is the pain the dominant problem of the condition or is the disability the, pro the dominant problem of the condition you have in front of you, in the individual in front of you? So if the pain is the dominant thing, I will do the blood flow restriction as a pain modulation level. I will try to decrease pain before start loading. Mm -hmm. If the dysfunction or the function itself is a problem, then I would use blood flow restriction in order to strengthen the muscle, gain the muscle volume that I want through time, plus engage um, muscle recruitment, fibers, neural drive through the process, and then you get to a different outcome compared to the other one. So this is in my mind, clinical reasoning, dominance of pain or dysfunction, and then you use the blood flow restriction uh, accordingly. Yeah, we, it's funny you mentioned those exactly two, those two things. So we, back in 2021, during COVID, so this was actually like in 2020, um, it's funny because like you look at 2021, 2022, and you just see so many review papers that are coming out because all the research just got shut down from COVID. But I I was on text chains with a couple of other instructors um, that teach BFR and that was kind of the genesis of the perceived barriers to blood flow restriction training paper um, that we were keep on. We kept on getting asked about device selection. We kept on getting asked about safety screening. We kept on getting asked about the importance of working hard in exercise. Like people are getting scared of that metabolic stress burning type sensation. And then we also had questions about how important the pressure is. And I think we're still we're still a ways away from really zoning in on the true importance of pressure because we know there's not a direct linear relationship between the amount of applied pressure and the blood flow restriction. But we do know that there is some minimal applied pressure that's needed to actually accelerate the fatigue process, at least in the lower limbs. When we're, when we're talking about like McQuell, Mikhail Cerquera's research in JSCR, in 2021 that basically said that we need at least 50% of the AOP to meaningfully accelerate fatigue in resistance exercise. So the the thing that you mentioned about you basically, and you kind of mentioned pain, but then we also funneled that in, in, in terms of what is an appropriate BFR training candidate. You're either load compromised, so disability, function, whatever, or you're pain compromised. It just so happens that a lot of individuals that we see as physical therapists or anybody working in rehabilitation, they're both, right? So yeah. so people come and they ask, they're like, and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts um, about this. Um, but people ask, is this person an appropriate BFR training candidate? Um, and they list a diagnosis. And I I I, I know I I have I'm very interested to hear because you teach a lot in Europe and I've taught in Europe as well. Um, and so I'm very interested to hear what people want in terms of, you know, that answer. Yep. Uh, the, the most important thing as an answer to your question is risk stratification in terms of the individual. So first of all, we need to know the relative and the absolute risks to the application of blood flow restriction. This is number one. 
I'm not interested in the condition, I'm interested in the risk. I have pinned on my Twitter, now X, wall, and it's free for everybody, uh, an algorithm of use of blood flow restriction, and it's free for everybody to, 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 uh, to find it and, and follow with my thoughts now. So first is screening of the individual. If the individual is okay for blood flow restriction intervention, yes, we say, okay, continue. And there is a lot of stuff that I've taken from your studies and your uh, observations. Plus some other stuff from the Japanese thing with a five point system or whatever you know about this. Nakajima, Nakajima, yep. height yep. camps. Yep. Whoever height camp was, he adapted this table. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool, a novel. Um, but but yeah, also, um, have you come across the Australian Institute of Sports Screener? Nope. So so the reason why I mentioned that because you're on screening. Um, I I I initially saw this about th two two and a half years ago, and I was like, "Yeah, it's really tailored for athletes." Um, but I keep on coming back to it because I like it more and more and more. In fact, I like it so much that I use it for my safety screening section now because <laughs> it's it's so it's it's not super conservative and this is where i actually really would like to dig in um because there there's a lot of of uncertainty around the application of blood flow restriction and i'm interested to hear your thoughts on safety screening but to wrap up the ais screening tool they really only have four absolute contraindications and all of them have to do with some vascular type compromise Everything else is a relative contraindication, which I love because speaking with that, like I spoke with a vascular surgeon uh, a couple months back uh, on a radio show, and he was even saying how he feels that BFR, even in those type of patients, and there's now been one hypothesis paper, um, which is excellent. If you haven't come across it, uh, Vogel and cell uh, cells or I think it's on, a, I, don't, I don't know where, what public, but it's excellent because it makes the hypothesis that even in peripheral vascular disease, that we can use blood flow restriction to create an even more hypoxic localized environment to then get that reactive uh, hyperemic response to induce microcapillary formation. So the reason why I'm talking about this is that there's so many things that we think are inappropriate for blood flow restriction, but we're finding that more and more people are applying it safely and not having um, these these uh, safety events that we you know are are and like even in the uh, like a couple of weeks back in thorax a paper on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease like things where we're like well wait a second here and that's what's really exciting about about blood flow restriction to me from the clinical side I'm not actually super interested in the clinical side believe it or not um, but in terms of these these populations where we're like, well, wait a sec. Why I've seen several publications yeah, like this uh, COPD, geriatric patients, stroke, and it was really shocking from uh, from the one side, but on the, on the other side, uh, we are afraid of things that might happen and we make assumptions and we hold strong beliefs about stuff that usually will never happen or probably will happen even going to the gym and doing other stuff. Yeah. But uh, what you've said reminds me of a paper, that, a, a review that is published in 2016 from an um, ex-East Europe country. I don't remember the name of the publication and they listed five complete absolute contraindications and a thorough list of relative contraindications by including smoker. Sorry? I know a paper you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, um, uh, flight for more than three hours or something this like is this. The case in the case in case in, yes. Acta Physiologica. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that that is the paper that I've used as a very conservative screener. Yes. Um, because I think I think that that's a nice paper where if you're a fitness professional, it says if you have diabetes, consult a doctor. If yeah. you have hypertension, consult right. a doctor. But. Yeah. When we're, at least in the United States, we're all doctors of physical therapy. 
And so we have autonomy. So that is the, you know, that is the consultation, which is why I also love the Australian Institute of Sports Screener because they go and they take the patient through. So you hand them, it's a three or four page document and they hand you through and they basically say, has your provider explained to you the risks and benefits associated with BFR before they even start the screener? Yeah, so yeah. you're getting consent. You're getting the the initial process started. You're you're saying, hey, if for whatever reason I've, I've I haven't explained to somebody that I'm going to do BFR with them, boom, and then it goes through the four conditions, and then it goes through like a, a two pages of like you know relative um, precautions, and I, it's it's such a nice tool, and I like it because it's not super conservative like the case in Strazar screener, because if you, the case in Strazar screener, in my opinion, is one that screens out a ton of patients that we're going to, that, that could benefit from the use of BFR. But, you know, again, we see patients in, in our practice that have comorbidities. So like, this is going to be some, this is a large proportion of our patients. So it's like for, for that kind of screener, to me, it's, it's a little bit too conservative now, but if I'm going to be teaching fitness professionals, I absolutely use that screener. Totally agree with you. Uh, however, have in mind uh, the recent publication, a case study in GOSPT cases of... Uh, I, can't, I can't find that one, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I know I, you're I will talking send, about I will, I will send it to you. Plus, also have in mind that uh, doctors, they used to do operations with complete occlusion of the limb for 45 minutes, one hour, whatever, and with no issues. Plus, in hospital, we used to use blood flow restriction second day post-op after initial reconstruction and use it. And then the answer was, uh, you know, you have the doctor just above of you, above you, so you can have a chat with them and decide if you can apply or not. But we used to apply it to everybody. So I think we're quite conservative because it's uh, not really explored area. And we are not communicating actually our clinical practice altogether. So there is no communication between the States and the Europe and Europe and Australia. And we're just waiting for everybody to publish something and try to merge, mix and match what we use compared to the rest of the world. But mm -hmm. the criteria in the different sides of the world are different. The law in the States are completely different to Greece and completely different to Australia. So mm -hmm. we need to figure out a way in order to inform clinical practice and transfer this knowledge in, um, and use it in uh, in our actual clinical practice, not only in research. Mm -hmm. So I know, we got, I know we got sidetracked, right? So we talked okay. about your initial, your initial screening, right? Your questions. So take us through then, like you have somebody who's disability or pain then what's the next part of your screening process? Uh, so this is the basic question. Uh, we discuss about the risk strat stratification. Now it's done. The box is ticked. If the patient is okay for blood flow restriction intervention, then we continue. And then we say your dominant issue is pain or dysfunction or um, you, are, you have a problem, load compromised, okay? So if it's pain, then we use blood flow restriction as a pain modulation method. So we decrease pain and then loading normally through uh, functional or machine training. Uh, in the other case, and this comes to your next question, if the pain has also pain along with dysfunction, then you just use your clinical reasoning. And this is one of the main decisions you will take as an evidence-based practitioner. You will use the best available evidence according to your clinical experience plus what patient. the patient wants. Yeah. So you will ask your patient, what is your dominant issue? Do you feel that is the pain or the lack of strength or the eccentric control? And if the patient decides that the pain is the dominant thing, we will deal with the pain. If not, and the pain is not that severe, I guess, and this is a highly educated guess, <laughs> that if you will go for blood flow restriction training, even though uh, having a, on the back of your head that I'm doing this in order to strengthen the individual, the pain will be decreased. And this is, I guess, it's a, it's a clinical observation that you have already uh, observed with your patients, I, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think when we implement blood flow restriction, we can anticipate, you know, for me at least, my bias and, and the way that I enter the BFR 
space is through hypertrophy. And the reason why, there you go, I guess AI thought that was that was a good one. Uh, and the reason why is because we know, and this is more recent than not, but um, we know that we can get hypertrophy at a variety of different loading parameters. So as low as 30%, although in free flow, that might be a little bit less, uh, you know, we might need at least 40, maybe 50% if we're comparing 80% um, percent or so of the one rep max. But generally speaking, for, for our patients, like maybe not for me, someone's looking to maximize growth, we probably need, uh, we probably can get loading across a variety of different parameters. Um, but the 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 issue with low loads is we have to push ourselves extremely hard in order to get to those high threshold motor units that are going to respond to that mechanical tension if that's the primary driver of growth to then get those visible gains in muscle mass and strength. So a lot of the way that I approach my blood flow restriction education is through the lens of regular strength training. And then once we understand how regular strength training works, then we can fit BFR in as simply a tool for resistance exercise, at least, that we can accelerate the fatigue process and get to the same results. Potentially, we can even, and, and this is where I kind of, my mind goes with is, which is we know that the that BFR reduces the floor for hypertrophic gains. So, so we have evidence from Jeremy Lenicky's lab that we can get you know as low as 15%. Even some studies use body weight. Although again, for those that are listening, body weight literally might be 20 to 30% of their one rep max, right? So keep that in mind. But I'm interested in, well, wait a second. If we have a very low load BFR and we take them, you know, 15 or 20%, but then we compare that to 30% without BFR. And then we compare that to 80% without BFR. Is the BFR growth able to increase a beyond that 30 or 20 or 30 percent and that would be interesting because then that says that bfr through the accelerating fatigue process we're actually able to squeeze out a little bit more gains um but the reason why i enter through muscle is because when we know that we're producing muscle we're probably doing other things that are beneficial to multiple tissue types and that's really what's bearing out in the research which that my, it was kind of comes into my next question, which is what are you excited about hearing? Because now we're seeing that there's potential impact on tendon through, you know, Christoph Sentner's lab, um, which again, interested to hear your thoughts on that. Where you know, the uh, paper that was published out of uh, Texas was looking at BFR, uh, attenuating the loss of uh, bone mineral density at the distal femur, proximal fibula in a cohort of post-op ACL. Um, and then we also have vascular adaptations, right? So if we producing this muscle growth, we can be sure that we're implementing some sort of additional stimulus to these tissue types, which may help in post-surgery or post-injury rehab. Uh, thank you for this introduction and question, because you've touched uh, three things that I'm really interested in. First of all, 1RM, that is the most difficult part to calculate in clinical populations. And I don't know how you do this. And I would like to learn about this and observe many clinicians, how they deal with that, because the output of the muscle is the actual output of the muscle is the neural drive is how much the pain let me do or whatever. So this is one thing that we cannot figure out for the moment and standardize for everybody. There is equations, but the equations are going down to the seeds of uh, the calculation. It's, population dependent. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to use an, any, any equa equation in order to use it in my clinical practice. I use uh, observation and my experience. It's not evidence, but this is my bias. Mm -hmm. So one thing, 1RM, it's, uh, it's the unicorn of the clinical experience and the clinical population. We know that exists, but we haven't seen anyone precisely in front of us. Um, so that's why we should use blood flow restriction, because if you get this fatigue, this uh, exertion, you know that the exercise worked. And this is one thing, and I will stop there. And then you said something about muscul the, 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 the effect of strain on the muscle. And then this ring the bell with the studies of Sentner and the tendons. 
we know that in order to stimulate tendon tissue adaptations and changes, structural and mechanical properties, you need the percentage of strain. And I know that this percentage of strain is the result of the musculotendinous junction because of most of the studies have done measurements in this area and not the tendon itself. Mm -hmm. And this might be variable depending on how strong is the muscle or how stiff is the tendon. Mm -hmm. However, by applying 30% of one RM, that means one third of what you should do in order to apply this, the, to apply a supra threshold strain to the tendon to change, it's a bit shocking for me. So if it were a second group replicating these studies, I would be a believer that what we know has changed. Mm -hmm. It's something that is wrong or probably it's not, we're not holding the whole truth to this subject. The whole tendon rehabilitation has been based on that. Strain, tendon changes, no strain, forget it. And now you will see minimal load with the application of something that is, we don't know what is that. We don't know what is blood flow restriction. We don't know if the effect of in pain is better with a six centimeter or a 12 centimeter. And we don't know if you do five sets is better than six sets. And we don't know how much of an adaptation you get through the process and how much load is your one RM or your 30% RM. So we don't know so many things, but this is how, something that has to be investigated and communicated in the scientific community, community in order to decide if we need to change our thoughts and we change the base of our clinical reasoning. But this is quite interesting uh, for me, the findings that they found in Achilles and patella tendon. And there is, I think, six studies so far published. Yeah, they're like acute studies looking at different changes in, in the Achilles um, in terms of like what they do post-exercise ultrasound or heat yeah. sensing or whatever. Some of that stuff I'm whatever. Um, but then my question to you is right. So you have a, you have, you have somebody that comes in that has a tendinopathy. How does BFR fit into, into your model uh, yeah. of okay. prescribing and, and yeah. what do you tell people that they're like, okay, like, let's just do BFR for this. I will use my clinical reasoning and I will give you bullet points again. So uh, I want to be honest, first of all, I don't not believe, I'm not a strong believer of the finding by using BFR and changing tissue properties in terms of tendon. So I'm not gonna use blood flow restriction to change the tendon tissue. Uh, we know that most of the true tendinopathic patients, they have a muscle that is not that strong. I say this is a correlation and not a causational relationship. Mm -hmm. It's a correlation. So most of the times, what we do with our tendon patients, education plus load modification. And the second part is strengthen the muscle, that's it. And here where it's blood flow restriction fits within the equation of my treatment. You can strengthen the muscle by decreasing the domes in the sequential application during the week. You can increase your sessions during the week and you can get the maximum out of it. When the person is ready to load as supposed to be, load the tissues, then I will stop the blood flow restriction. There is a few cases that the pain mechan the pain is dominant mechanism in tendinopathy because most of the loading procedures we do, the pain is related to the rate of the loading of the tissue. So mm -hmm. if you do something slowly for the tendon, it's probably nothing. So if you will not go to plyometrics or fast movements and changing of directions, probably you don't get any issues of pain. So First of all, blood flow restriction during the strengthening process. If there is more studies coming from other groups supporting the idea that low load with blood flow restriction may change tendon tissue properties and substance, I will be all in to that also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tend to agree. I think for people that are saying, you know, I think, first of all, I think it's great that we have evidence that says that BFR has a potential way is a potential way to modify um certainly pain um but potentially the properties of tendons i agree with you in terms of the strain issue we need the gold standard is is heavy loads but it is interesting to see how even in the case series that there was two decathlon uh two decathletes yep. that came Keith in Moore. yeah and um 
and, and how they were doing a, a two or three exercise protocol to help them stay stay healthy. But I think you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater if you're saying, all right, well, we're just going to abandon heavy loads now because we can use BFR. And I think that when students come to me and they're like, oh, wait a second, I can just use BFR. Then I was like, absolutely not, because we have hundreds of studies that show that heavy loading is probably the gold standard for tendinopathy management, right? So, yeah. I will interrupt at this point and I will discuss about the recent systematic review by Stephanie Lazarchuk from Australia. She's a PhD student that has done amazing, amazing job. Uh, tendon tissue properties with load. There is no moderator, high, low, whatever. The only thing that changes tendon, according to their systematic review, is the strain. High strain changes tendon. So I'm not convinced that 30% of my 1RM can produce a significant strain to these individuals in order to change the tendon, unless the tendons were extremely compliant. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I have a question mark over there. However, taking the evidence into account, you need high strain. And high strain, you cannot have with 30% of 1RM. Yeah, no, I mean, and so like the so finishing up just that loop, it's that we know that that's the evidence. So if you're spending a significant period of time using BFR and not doing heavy lifting, you're missing, you're missing, you're missing out. And your patient's not going to be benefiting from the gold standard treatment. Um, so that, you know, that to me is always something where, it's, you know, and this kind of kind of segues into some of the BFR like characteristics and device features is that people are are getting on the BFR bandwagon because it's get you know, it's hot. They're getting published like, but unfortunately, there's a lot of oversights that researchers are having with the implementation of this technology because they're just thinking that everything is blanketly the same. And I don't think we have enough evidence to suggest that that's the case. And I'm interested to hear, you know, your thoughts on the different technologies that are available and what have you seen as a BFR educator um, with regards to the different ways in which BFR has been applied? What is your line in the sand in terms of, you know, how would you recommend clinicians apply it in their practice? Yeah, I, I will speak, uh, I will state my personal opinion. And this is just a statement as a conflict of interest before I say anything else. Uh, I'm against flushing because this is something uncontrolled. People consider it as a blood flow restriction application. Oh, yeah, you know what? yeah, flushing. Forget it. This is not something uh, I'm against bands. I see in the gym guys that they are using fabric and uh, I'm against all this stuff. And then if you have something that is controllable, I would say that, uh, and this is a stolen statement from uh, Mike Reynolds, the machine is going to be better than you all the time if you know how to use it. And the machine is the device or whatever you want. So if you get something that is inflatable and you can calculate something, this is going to be more reliable than you are or your perception or your eyes or whatever. So I would like to use something that you can at least see how much of an occlusion you are applying of the pressure you're applying to the limb. And then we come up with a with the idea that I use an external Doppler and something that is inflatable by using my hand and the auto-regulated machines with uh, cell phone applications and the two machines that I'm aware of, one in the States and one in Europe. And I was, uh, is that a problem to state the names? No, listen, I no. don't get paid. I don't get paid by any of these cuff companies. <laughs> I, me, I have no bias. Okay. I mean, if, you, if you've oh. seen... Some of Delphi, my Delphi yeah. and Madap. These are the two auto-regulated yeah. machines. There is a recent study uh, published in BJSM with regards to the auto-regulated and non-auto-regulated machines that gives us a very good idea of what you can do or what you cannot. Uh, but uh, in my course, I want to talk about that. By the way, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, I, I was this. I designed that study. Um, oh, wonderful. So, yeah, I was second author, um, and and that kind of feeds into. That is the primary example that I give for the stimulus of BFR not being the same, even though something suggests that it's auto-regulated. So for, for that, what I mean 
is that I teach with a variety of different devices. And it's great that you mentioned that study because so prior to that, you know, for me, I'm all about in, I'm all about how can we grow blood flow restriction safely with the, the vast heterogeneities that exist in terms of the patient populations, in terms of the economy, right? To be able to buy certain devices, to be able to, you know, espouse research that is digestible, that has provides guidelines and whatever. So for me, I teach with all these different devices, MatUp, Delphi uh, included. And I was noticing like, you know, a lot of these companies, they're saying, hey, like we need this auto-regulation or this auto-regulation is something that really definitively separates us because it's supposed to do, it's supposed to do something um, and uh, adjust to the limb or whatever. But what's interesting is that um, there really hasn't been any research on auto-regulation prior to the stuff that I'm trying to spearhead, um, which, which the first paper, you probably are aware of it, like Luke, Luke Hughes' first PhD, I think it was his first PhD paper, that was comparing the Hokanson to the occlusion cuff to the Delphi, and basically yep. showed that the Delphi mitigated perceptual and mean arterial pressures, uh, perceptual responses, rate of perceived exertion, and rate of perceived discomfort or pain and uh, mean arterial pressure, and also was was provided a more uniform stimulus to the limb. And that was really the only paper that we had to go for. But the problem is none of these cuffs were standardized according to their widths. And so like we we couldn't really, you couldn't really isolate the effect of autoregulation. And I don't know about you, but I don't even know if Hokanson can autoregulate because I've actually called the company and the and the person that answered because Hokanson is well published, right? There's yes. some of the research. So so like I even called and the lady was like, well, it just pumps up to the pressure and it <laughs> like that's the pressure. But I was like, well, does it adjust the pressure according to anything? And she, uh, I don't know. I think you could have as an as an add-on, but not really. So we have really no idea whether or not the Hokanson was truly auto-regulated or not. And that's a shame because that would really enlighten a significant part of the body of research. But I get into this because the auto-regulation, and I'm here, I'm interested to hear your thoughts, that the smart cuffs auto-regulation function is pretty weak. Meaning that, have you used the smart tools by any, by any chance? No, okay. I have used the VALD application and the VALD cuffs. So the VALD isn't auto-regulated. That's just pumps it up and it stays there. Um, and there is an issue with uh, how much of a pressure they apply to the lower yeah, limb. Yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah, I don't, I, I don't really, I don't really use, uh, use those cuffs um, from a Bluetooth perspective. I just had so many problems, but, um, but yeah, so we, we saw that and I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are and your takeaways are, but the smart tools device. So whereas the, so I will rank the auto-regulated devices on the market. The first one is the mat up. I will say that only because it's so tight, you can't even tell that it's auto-regulating. And that's because the thing is a tank. It's a huge piece of equipment and you really can't even tell. So the motor is so fine-tuned um, and that's where I want to- But it's a light as, an, as a device, it's quite light compared yeah. to the- yeah. yeah, and and so like it's so nice and 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 auto, like the the actual auto regulation feature is so tight and so um, responsive that you can't even tell that it's doing auto regulation. And then we have the Delphi, and the Delphi unit is has been studied tens of studies, maybe you know hundreds, whatever. Um, but that really adjusts quick, so you're able to to do it and it adjusts. And then you have. Fit cuffs and smart tools. So Fit cuffs recently developed their auto-regulated device. They're predominantly in Europe, um, and I've been using their device pretty extensively um, as a trial and things like that. And I think that it's it's a pretty decent software. Uh, and then smart tools. So it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm, with that being said, we're on the other end of the continuum with regards to the responsiveness to auto-regulation. So I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are, not having used the smart tools, but now what are your, what are your takeaways from that study given, um, given well, I'll, I'll just leave it at that because I'm very interested because this is, this is okay. why, by the way, I love having these conversations because the researchers such as yourself 
don't necessarily have the hands-on experience to see the differences. And for better or worse, this helps shape our education. And I'm trying to just get more people to be aware that not auto, not all auto regulation responds the same. Yep. I have used the occlusion cuffs. I have used uh, surgery tourniquets. I have used MADAP. I have used Delphi. I have used VALD. I've used a lot of devices. And the occlusion cuffs from uh, Denmark also. Uh -huh. I haven't used the, the ones that you said, but I will start from the beginning and say we're trying to understand how the technical characteristics of a device might modify, change, adapt, or whatever, a response of a musculotendinous system through a loading process before we have standardized everything with regards to the loading. So for example, the device will give you completely different stuff as an application if you use different intensity, different load, different rate, different sets, different rest, um, contraction mode, whatever. So it's a, it's a mixture of everything. So if we standardize the process of loading and the loading is the same, and then you start adding different devices to see what's the effect of that, then you need to standardize the cuff size. Chambers or not, you know the story, I'm not going to go there. Uh, and the letter to the editors, and so you know this stuff. Mm -hmm. But this is one thing. Then some of the cuffs are completely squared and some other are like this. So they just follow the normal uh, configuration of the thigh or the limb. So this is completely different. There is a autoregulation of the MADAP that is smooth. There is the autoregulation of Delphi that is okay because it's highly adjustable. But you, if you move with the Delphi, you have to go through the process of calculation again. So it doesn't give me a big... Um, uh, tends to be a little bit more inventive during the process. And then if you're talking to students that they haven't done this before, instead of telling them, just take a cuff and try it, it will be safer for everybody because you don't know, you need to go through the process of the experience, of the experimentation, of the repetition in order to standardize and be internally reliable. I would say use something that is auto-regulated so just for safety reasons instead of taking this as inflated. I've been through this process in the past. As I told you, 120 lower limb, six centimeters to everybody. It doesn't matter if the guy is two meters tall or 160, 55 kilos. So we've done this and through the process, we learned how to adjust and to standardize the, the process. I would go if I had the money because now we are in the, I don't know what's the situation in the States, but here in, uh, in Europe, um, everybody has a teka or a windback. Everybody has a diamagnetic pump. Everybody has a, I don't know, ice application. Everybody spends money for no reason. So if I have some money to spend now as a physiotherapist and I want to make my clinic, I would buy a handheld dynamometer. I would buy a isokinetic dynamometer and not a regulated device. I, I'm not going to say it if it's MADAP or Delphi. My bias is MADAP. And then I will give money to, to take equipment in order to do strengthening. So if you have to spend 10 or 15,000 or 20,000, give five or six to buy something that is auto-regulated and do not buy something with 200 bucks that you don't know how to use it. And then it depends on how perpendicular you're gonna use your external Doppler on the tibial artery or whatever and make things non-standardized. Safety-wise, I say this. If you're experienced, I can do my stuff with just a small Doppler ultrasound and something that is inflatable, even though it's not a branded cuff. That's my take on it. And I'm, I'm sure we're I, on the same I, I tend, I, te I tend to agree. I think, I think um, the way that I, the way that I answer this question is there's three different things you have to consider. You have to consider number one, your patient population. So if your patient population has more comorbidities, more you know, is older or, you know, anything that's going to theoretically, right, increase the risk of some sort of adverse response, that's something you have to consider. Then you have to consider your budget, as you mentioned before. The problem with auto-regulated devices is that a lot of clinics can't afford them. 
And the the cheaper auto-regulated devices, and we'll kind of bow, bow wrap this combo um, with that, are that they're not as responsive. And actually, I would argue that if you're using an auto-regulated device that's not responsive, you probably are getting less BFR stress per repetition. And that was evident by the fact that the, the auto-regulated group in the failure condition did 23.6% more repetitions is because if the device is not able to quickly adjust, you have blood that's leaving the extremity. So that may, by the way, be a reason to use it if you are worried about the risk of occlusion and the fact that we didn't really have any blood pressure changes, which is kind of shocking um, uh, and, and perplexing. But that's that. And then three is your tolerance for risk as a clinician. If you're able to say, hey, I totally agree. If you're beginning and you want an auto, I say an automatic device. So whether that's auto-regulated or that's just something that has an algorithm that's built in, preferably it's validated. Uh, so you know exactly what your pressure is. So you want more precision, not less, that you can say, hey, all right, well, I've done BFR for years and I think that I'm okay with using a Doppler or having a device that's not auto-regulated because for me, and I'd be curious to hear your perspective, I actually think that as long as you're standardizing the cuff to a percent of arterial or limb occlusion pressure, I believe that that is probably from a cuff specific angle, the biggest variable that you can do to reduce your risk and then furthering reducing your risk would be implementation. And taking into account the patient that's in front of you, if the patient is a vigorous CrossFit athlete, well, then my initial implementation of BFR is going to be different than if I have a 75-year-old grandma who's never exercised before. And that is kind of the, the mental model that I have regarding the device selection and how you would reduce risk. So I'd be curious to hear kind of your thoughts on, on that. I'm, um, I'm on your side on that with a few differences. I would say that I would never use blood flow restriction in uh, older individuals or individuals with no gym experience in order to decrease pain because the perception on the bulk Agreed, scale. by the way. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. So I, I would use uh, BFR in low load uh, with uh, low occlusion pressure just to stimulate some changes and adaptations. Uh, on the other end, safety first. So if you don't know what you do, try something that is auto-regulated. However, if you know what you do, the you're just mitigating the risk, that's all. Because if you will do five sets, probably the pressure that you used in the first set is not the same on the fifth set. So there is a change. And if you don't know what you're doing, probably this change is not measurable or it's not completely understood during the process in a, in a cuff that is not auto-regulated. But if you are a clinician or a researcher or a strength and conditioning coach that you know what you're doing and you're using a color Doppler and you have standardized the process and you know that the occlusion pressure that you're using is just this percentage and there is a, there is a, a, a range of pressures that you're playing, then you can use it without using a completely auto-regulated machine. That's my my take on that. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a pretty sound take on it. I think that um, so so here here I know we only have about ten minutes left, but so here's my my thoughts on pressure and why I've kind of mo migrated a lot more toward moderate pressure and how that potentially impacts the auto regulation bias um, or not. And so what we do know first and foremost is that we accelerate fatigue with the, with the use of blood flow restriction, right? That regardless of the mechanism, that's kind of what it is. Okay. So what, what is the most commonly cited mechanism that we're, we're enhancing metabolic stress to ultimately create that fatiguing response? Okay. So then with the pressure, we know that through regular strength training studies, that the microvasculature of the triceps, for example, or the quads, we basically create full intramuscular occlusion at 25 to 30, maybe 40% of the one rep max. So the microvasculature 
that is around the muscle is completely closed off. So we are, we are now, it doesn't matter if there's more pressure that's applied to the limb during a contraction, at least my, that's my bias now until I see more research, but it doesn't matter besides, yeah, it's going to be on more uncomfortable or potentially more uncomfortable, like, cause you're pushing the cuff against, but the actual vasculature is already closed. So then my then thing goes, okay, if we know that then, then why do we need super high pressure in order to create that effect? If all the pressure is doing is trying to prevent that microvasculature from, from being, uh, from offloading those metabolites into the venous system. And now you're creating that. So that's kind of my thought process. So then with autoregulation, you know, I've been very interested in this only because as I said earlier, my interest is trying to grow BFR and trying to figure out what is marketing and what is the actual science. And right now it's interesting because we took that first study with smart tools and we said, all right, well, let's do another study that, and we did two studies so far. Um, we're a third that is about to enter data collection, but we use the Delphi, which is a little bit better of an auto-regulation device. And we did uh, wall squats and we looked at central stiffness. We looked at, um, which is very, which has never been really looked at in the BFR literature. So the aortic response, um, as well as perceptual volume um, and perceptual and volume and likelihood to perform. And we found that in the legs, the Delphi, contrary to what we found with a less responsive auto-regulation feature, we found that there was no difference in performance or no difference in perceptual as well. So meaning that they, they both were exercising, all conditions exercise, we anchored it to a low load control. So we wanted to look at the magnitude of fatigue between the BFRs and the low load, as well as the magnitude of fatigue differences uh, in terms of repetitions to fatigue between the auto-regulated and the non-auto-regulated setting. We had Delphi, they actually created a feature where they just pumped it up and they didn't, didn't auto-regulate. Um, and so that was interesting. We also found that the auto-regulated condition actually blunted acute increases in central stiffness compared to the non-auto-regulated as well as the low load control, which again, doesn't really make sense. I think we only had 20 people in the study, but, um, but everybody went through the condition. So that, for, that paper alone basically suggests that the device features, and again, we're different body regions, um, pressure, whatever, but at least show that, that the auto-regulation, if it's tight, it actually doesn't impact the, the response. And then we have another paper that we did in the biceps. And we said, all right, well, let's, is this same patterning <clears throat> changing? And it turns out that auto-regulated in the upper body actually was perceived as more uncomfortable then, and it was slight. Honestly, when you look at the data, you're gonna see it's clinically irrelevant, but we had a statistical difference, um, was a little bit more uncomfortable. We had no changes in central stiffness in any of the conditions. So it's just opening up another area for me because I, and the reason why I bring this up is only because I wanna grow BFR. And if BFR set, and if the BFR literature starts to come out and says, well, wait a second, in order to safely grow BFR, like a meaningful risk reduction, we need to use auto-regulation. Well, then I go and that's where, you know, that is regardless of the other ways to apply BFR, if this is going to meaningfully reduce risk, then I'm going to lean toward auto-regulation. And right now though, the data just doesn't support that auto-regulation is a must needed feature. Although, as you mentioned before, it makes sense, right? It makes sense. Like you want to adjust the pressure. It might change the, the hemodynamics, the perceptual responses, but right now, uh, and that's, what's so fascinating to me about this, this little area that I find uh, myself in is like, it, it could or could not, and it could really shape how we implement BFR in the future. This is a quite different perspective. What you have just discussed, uh, from my clinical point of view, the pressure plays a significant role and we're talking about high pressures in terms of the hypoallergenic effect. Mm -hmm. This is anecdotal evidence. Uh, with MADAP, we figure out how to down, uh, to, 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 to volume down the, the, the occlusion. So for example, we were able to do like 5% or 10% of an occlusion just to see if there is an effect. Mm -hmm. There is no effect in terms of hypoalgesia up to pressures, we are talking about the lower limb, to 60 or 65%. 
So whatever we have observed is more than 65 or 70% occlusion plus by using the same exercise protocol. So I'm a little bit biased in terms of pain reduction and occlusion percentage. However, in terms of strengthening, I don't mind I may use 30% of occlusion or 50% or of occlusion or 25 or even less depending on the individual in front of me. Well, I agree with you. I agree we need higher pressures for, for hypoalgesic response just based on the normal literature and increasing that. Um, but but yeah, I mean, for strengthening, it, it just a moderate amount of pressure, if that's the goal is to accelerate fatigue, my bias is, hey, well, I want to induce the least amount of discomfort and the least perturbation to their cardiovascular system in order to get the minimal therapeutic dose that will give them that, that response. I just haven't been convinced. And my practical experience from me as somebody who studies BFR and uses BFR re pretty regularly, but also from the research that we truly need high, high pressures for muscle strengthening, unless the load is extremely low. Like I do recommend that if you're doing something like a quad set and you're early on in the post-op period and we want to induce some sort of fatigue, then maybe we could do 70 to 80% of pressure. But once you start to add some you know, dynamic type exercise, I, th I think the discomfort that's produced and the benefit that you're going to get, the seesaw starts to swing a little bit um, in, in, in the direction it's of lower low pressure. If the load threshold is really low, then probably you should use higher volumes, you know, higher occlusion pressure in order to get an effect. Yep. But if the load is enough and you are above threshold, so probably you need to decrease the, the occlusion pressure. This is clinical reasoning, as you said, this is how we use it. But there, it's only specific conditions and time frames that you can adjust towards high load with uh, high occlusion pressure with mm -hmm. low load for strengthening, but I don't see high high occlusion and strength, strengthening fit together nowhere in the rehabilitation scheme of most of the musculoskeletal yeah. conditions that I deal with. Mm -hmm. So let's bow tie this combo. Um, I, I want to ask you, in your opinion, what are a couple of things that you're looking forward to? in the next couple of years, potentially learning about blood flow restriction and how would that shape how you educate others on its implementation? Yeah, uh, it's uh, your question, your, your, your answer, my answer to your question is quite simple. Risk, this is what I wanna know. Should I be afraid of using blood flow restriction to everybody or not? This is one of my main interests for the moment, uh, plus the research for tendons. <laughs> I'm really into tendons, that's why. I'm, uh, yeah. and, and I'm not saying that they are wrong, yes? Because uh, once you get something from a research group, this might be uh, something completely different to, to a mistake or whatever, or uh, an overlook. Might be high specialized persons, so they know what they're doing, researchers. Mm -hmm. So I'm not uh, against that. I'm just saying I want to see more in tendons. And if this will happen, this will be the... The, a change and a shift in my beliefs, first of all, and then uh, in my research interest. <laughs> no, great. Yeah, I think I think it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to to see how the next three to five years pans out because there's so much research that's coming out on on BFR. So trying really? to stay on top of it as somebody who prides himself on being aware of the most current re it's so challenging it's, yes it is it's really, it's really yes. so challenging though uh, out of the about 800 papers published the last four years uh 22 percent of them are reviews or systematic reviews mm -hmm. that means we're just replicating the same thing again and again and again from a different perspective yeah but uh, i guess uh, this uh, things will change yeah, I mean, hopefully it's, I'm looking forward to, there's a lot of cool projects that are, that I'm aware of that are finishing data collection or have finished data collection. So we'll learn more about the implementation of BFR following a muscle strain. Um, all these, all these different areas where people would, would be cautious about its implementation. So that's really what, what is exciting for me is, is to see 
is to continue to challenge our beliefs on what is safe and what is efficacious because just because exactly. it's safe doesn't mean it's efficacious and you know we better off doing something else um but anyways where can people find you where um you know plug your education courses whatever whatever you want to plug um right now um i'm in social media so social media in general plus twitter x korakakis v uh, you can find me in, in Instagram, Vasilios under slash Korakakis, and that's all. I have everything there. Uh, I'm located in Greece for the moment, and I spend a lot of time in the Netherlands with my daughters. Plus, I'm uh, traveling around Europe, and um, I hope uh, we can meet in the near future in a conference or if I will come over the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, I have to be better at applying to conferences in Europe. I just... I I have a fiance, a beautiful fiance, and um, good on you, mate. <laughs> and very good on me. And she takes great care of me. And I have two dogs, and so it's like hard for me um, already to, to. I'm already teaching a lot. Um, I teach about one to two courses a month privately um, for clinics, and then I travel. I have uh, the relationship with Kinesport, so I go to France two times a year usually. So it's just hard to like go to another conference, but I think that I'm nearing the point where I have some research that um, certainly people could benefit from, from having, uh, from hearing it. And, you know, so if there's ever opportunity, as I said, you know, we want to collaborate on a, on, on making a presentation, let's do it. Um, I, would, I, just, I would be happy to, what you have already said is a cheap excuse so try to find three days next year and let's meet in Copenhagen. Yeah, <laughs> is, for sure. Yeah. Let's let yeah, let's okay. do it. That's great. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I thank you. I was very much looking forward to this convo. Um, and I know that our viewers and listeners are gonna be taking a ton of of information away from this. And yeah, so just thank you so much and I look forward to networking and potentially collaborating on something in the near future. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm uh, really happy to meet you even online and uh, we're going to be in touch. Yeah, thank you so for much. sure. All right, everyone, that's the episode. Tune in next time. And that was today's episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, I would love if you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. I really appreciate the support.